Hello everybody, this is Kunal Mehta from Make Me Scientific and we are going to solve the standard 10 ICSA physics specimen paper which was uploaded by the council just before few months, right? So, the paper is divided again into two parts. One is MCQ, then there are descriptive questions as well. Let's begin with question number one, that are MCQs. So, the moment of couple has a tendency to rotate the body in an anti-clockwise direction. So, as per the conventions, we take the anti-clockwise couple or the anti-clockwise torque as positive. So, A option would be our correct answer. The kinetic energy of the body doesn't depend upon the position. It also doesn't depend upon the center of gravity. Yes, on the momentum and not the displacement. We see that kinetic energy is half mv square, but it can also be written as p square upon 2m. So, when mass is constant, more the momentum, more the kinetic energy. <clears throat> For burning the coal in a thermoelectric station, the energy conversion is. So, first of all, the coal itself is made up of carbon. So, it's a type of chemical. And when you heat the coal, the coal gets converted into carbon dioxide, oxidation simply. So, the chemical energy which is hidden in the coal gets converted into heat energy. So, chemical to heat. And then finally, the turbines, they actually move. So, the correct answer would be chemical to heat to mechanical, then chemical to heat to mechanical to electrical. So, B option would be the correct answer. A nucleus of an atom consists of 146 neutrons and 95 protons. So, let me write down X, Z, A. Z stands for the atomic number, that is 95, right? And this plus this, so basically 146 plus 95, so 1, 1, 14, 4, 1. So, basically 241 is the mass number, 241. Now, what happens is alpha particle is helium nuclei. So, when alpha particle is released, 2 He4, the atomic number decreases by 2. So, it gives you a new substance with 93 protons and then uh, 241 minus 4. So, basically this is 237, right? And if I subtract, I'll get the number of neutrons, 237 minus 93. So, this is 4, this is 13, and then I will get 144, right? So, that means 144 neutrons and 93 protons is the right answer. That is A option. Okay. Let's go ahead. The assertion and the reason type of question. Infrared radiations travel a long distance. That's very correct. They can travel with a speed of light to a very, very long distance and that is because its wavelength is very, very long. So, we do know that scattering is proportional to 1 over lambda raised to 4 in case of the Rayleigh scattering. So, if larger is the wavelength, smaller is the scattering, smaller the scattering, the waves can go to a very, very long distance. So, the assertion as well as the reason both are true. So, A option would be the correct answer. All right. Now, let's solve the next question. Okay. Let's put the object anywhere where we want. Let's call the distance from the lens to be x. So, basically x is the object distance and we do know that where the image is formed, right, at 2f. Okay, now the distance between the object and the image, let it be d, which means that the image distance will be d minus x. Okay, now what am I going to do is, I am going to apply the lens formula 1 upon v minus 1 upon q. Now, the focal length of the lens is positive. Let's use the sign convention that is 1 upon v. For this particular case, <coughs> So the focal length is positive as well as the image distance is also positive. So, d minus x, whereas this is 1 upon minus of x because object distance is negative. So, again, just simplifying it, this is 1 upon d minus x plus 1 upon x. Now, let's simplify this forward. 1 upon f that is equal to x plus d minus x times x d minus x square. Now, x x gets cancelled and let's cross multiply it. So, we get f d that is equal to x d minus x square, right? Now, let's take this x square on this side. So, x square minus xd minus fd, sorry, plus fd, that is equal to 0. We are transferring both the terms xd as well as minus x square on that side. Now, this becomes an equation in one variable, right? So, you already know that when we have an equation ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0, and we do know that its roots are x is equal to minus b plus minus under root of b square minus 4ac for 2a. All right. So, we are going to find the solution of this as x is equal to minus of b and b in this case is minus d. So, it will be minus of minus d. So, plus d plus minus under root of b square. So, that is d square minus 4 times a is coefficient of x square is 1. C is fd. So, what do we get upon 2a? So, 2 times of what? So, the roots of the equation are d plus or minus under root of d square minus 4 fd by now what is more important for us to know is that this part that this part should be real enough right if d square i'm saying if d square is less than right 4 
FD. What is going to happen? This under root will have negative number in it. That becomes a complex number. That's not possible. So we have to compulsorily at least take the value d square equal to 4 fd or d square greater than 4 fd because in these two cases you will get some number which is positive inside the root right and then you will be able to solve the further so solve the numerical further so the condition is d square should be at least greater than or at least it should be equal to 4 df now if i cancel d d from one side you are definitely getting the answer greater than or equal to 4f so the minimum answer is at least 4f 4f or greater than 4f so that means object at 2f and the image at 2f let's go ahead <clears throat> two sound waves have same amplitude which means they will have same loudness same wave pattern that means uh, wave pattern directly depends upon the harmonics so we can also call the quality of sound to be same but the frequencies are different so this is less shrill or the grave sound and higher the frequency we call high pitch sound or the shrill sound correct so x this is basically x and this is y so y is shrill and okay x will be shriller this is incorrect x will be gray y will be shriller this is correct x will differ in quality that is not possible because the waveforms are same loudness is also not possible as their amplitudes are same the option vibration produced in a body under the influence of periodic force is definitely a forced vibration nothing else is given now if we add further that the frequencies are same then we can decide whether it is resonant or not right now the graph shows the voltage versus current which can be used to make the coil of a toaster now basically toaster and those substances which produce a lot of heat like heaters toasters right their resistance should be extremely high because h heat produced is equal to i square times rd so if r is larger they can produce a large amount of heat thus by solving our purpose so if v versus i graph is given to you anything right like this and if i find the slope <coughs> slope is basically change in y-axis upon change in x-axis that is the resistance so we can very well see that p has the largest slope thereby the slope meaning the resistance so the highest resistance is of p so that gives our correct answer according to the old convention the color of the earth wire was green earthing wire was green in the olden days lens law is definitely based upon the law of conservation of energy so what do we basically have is a coil like this and then we are supposed to move the magnet in or out towards the coil and there should be a galvanometer and it will show deflection so basically our own work done because we are doing the work done against the repulsion or attraction so our work done gets converted into the uh, electrical energy over here <coughs> so the work done by us is the loss of energy from us the same energy is being produced over here in terms of electrical energy heat capacity of the body right so first of all heat capacity and specific heat capacity specific heat capacity is defined for one kilogram and for any other masses apart from unit masses we have heat capacity so definitely in your answer one kg should not come another another thing heat capacity and latent heat are different in latent heat temperature constant and state changes here temperature rises state or temperature falls the state remains the same so without the change in temperature is incorrect first option the energy needed to rise the temperature of a body by one degree the increase in the volume that is incorrect there is no increase in the volume as such the total amount of internal energy that is constant <clears throat> or we can say the energy needed to raise the temperature of a body by one degree celsius is the right answer because see heat energy is equal to m times c times delta t right so basically this is the heat energy and when i say that this is one degree celsius that becomes the heat capacity so that is basically m times the c so b option is the right answer the total amount of internal energy is incorrect right because it would be then uh, going into that molecular level and then combining it and see internal energy is a property of temperature so when temperature changes the internal energy changes and here it is written the internal energy is constant because when you increase the temperature of a body by one degree celsius definitely there should be rising the internal energy which is not the correct answer the amount of heat required to melt that means it should be either latent heat or specific latent heat for masses of a given mass so definitely it has to be a latent heat and that too melting so the word fusion should be used right so latent heat of fusion is the correct answer specific latent heat means for one kg which is not mentioned in the question denser to rarer in the next question when the ray goes from denser to rarer please make sure that you make the diagram first otherwise you might get confused right so compared to the angle of incidence and the ray bends away from the normal r is larger so i is greater sorry i is smaller than r or r is bigger than i speed increases 
wavelength also increases frequency remains constant no change in the frequency now let's match our answers the speed increases is the right answer wavelength should also increase so the d option is wrong angle of incidence definitely this is a wrong answer a ray bends towards the normal is a wrong answer endoscope uses an optical fiber now basically optical fiber uses tir so we send the light ray so it simply hits 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 and it simply goes out right and by the way this is the core part which is having higher refractive index than the upper part that is cladding so we don't allow the light to escape out by keeping the higher value of refractive index comparatively inside than the outside right so tir is the right answer <clears throat> let's move with question number two the principle of levers is principle of moments basically at a point at any point about the fulcrum the total clockwise moment is equal to total anti-clockwise moment which radiations are emitted during the decay of the nucleus definitely alpha beta and gamma but the highest penetrating power is of gamma radiations so gamma radiation is the correct answer they are simply the form of electromagnetic waves or they are simply a form of energy and when energy escapes out of the nucleus there is no change in the mass number or the atomic number so no change is the right answer right all right now the next question says that a meter rod is made up of copper and steel and that too it shows equal length so 50 centimeters of copper 50 centimeters of steel rod they are being joined together and then they are also saying that this has a weight of 10 newton oh i see and this is a bit lighter and we do know the fact that <clears throat> the center of gravity or the center of mass is always towards the heavier side so giving the equal length the heavier portion is towards the copper so that means the center of gravity could be somewhere inside the copper rod so 0 to 50 would be our right answer and justification means center of gravity is always towards the heavier side and since it is given by equal length the heavier side or the heavier weight is comparatively of the copper rod okay identify the type of lever pretty easy because the effort is in between so class 3 levers so it's a class 3 lever in which the effort is done effort is in the middle part calculate the mechanical advantage so the mechanical advantage is equal to effort arm upon load arm the effort arm is the distance from the effort to the load that is 0 0.4 meter and the load arm is from the fulcrum to the load all distances needs to be measured from fulcrum so this is the load arm so that is 0 0.5 and anyways right we do know the fact that the mechanical advantage of class 3 levers is less than one they are speed multipliers not the force multiplier so 4 by 5 that means 5 it's a 40 0 0.8 is the correct answer no unit because it's simply the ratio the kinetic energies of a and b are same compare their velocity okay half if the mass is of a is four times the mass of b so 4m times v a square is equal to half mass of b is m so that's why of the other one a is 4m v b square half m half m getting cancelled so v a square on v b square is equal to 1 by 4 that means v a is to v b is 1 is to 4 right <clears throat> draw the graph of the potential energy versus the height from the ground when thrown vertically upwards see by the way potential energy if we plot on y-axis and height above the ground that is 0 then h by 2 then h by 4 like that then potential energy is simply mgh so this is a function in y-axis and then let's say this is y is equal to mx plus c let's write the equation of a straight line and then in x-axis i'm going to plot the height you can see that the power of potential energy and h is 1 here also in equation of straight line the power of y and x are 1 so definitely it is a straight line graph passing through the origin yes of course because <clears throat> at height 0 that is on the surface of the earth the potential energy is 0 right so that is the answer to our problem okay now i should also say that you should write down that this point is h then exactly at h by 2 this is h by 2 you have here i should be writing mgh here i should be writing mgh by 2 here it should be 0 makes more sense right now the two copper wires a and b have same thickness that means the radius are same and are at room temperature no change in the temperature right length of a is twice the length of b so la is twice the length of b so it's better i should write down lb as l so la would be twice the l if lb is l correct okay compare the resistances resistance r is equal to rho times l by a now the <coughs> resistance of a i should be write down la a resistance of b compare means the ratio so rho l b on a b by the way i should be telling same material same resistivity that is rho and that is what is the answer for b part resistivities are same because the material is same so the ratios if rho is to rho answer is one is to one <clears throat> let's take the ratio r a 
upon RB that is rho rho will automatically get cancelled LA upon AA divided by so it will be A area of B upon length of B. Let's substitute the value. Now how are wires? They are cylindrical and the cylindrical area right the cylindrical area this is something like this. So the area of this part right that is pi r square and the lengths are say correct. So if I call if I say that the length is of the A is twice the length of B divided by the radius same thickness. So that means basically the area of the mouth is same and you should be very very careful that area is the area of the mouth through which the electrons enter. It is not the entire area of the rod it's the area of the mouth right and since the radius is same the mouth area are going to be the same. So AA and AB going to get cancelled and this is simply L. So resistances of A to B is 1 is 2. Or did I make an error? Yes, it is 2 is to 1. Yeah, 2 is to 1 is our correct answer. All right, so we move ahead. Uh, question number 7 says that name the waves used for echo depth sounding. So the, the process is known as sonar sound, navigation and ranging and we use ultrasonic sound waves. Ultrasonic sound waves and that is due to the fact that they can travel to a very long distance without scattering. And the speed in water is very very high about 1500 meter per second. So basically they are the sound waves which cannot be heard by humans right because its frequency is more than 20,000 hertz. So we use ultrasonic sound waves. <clears throat> as, I just meant, uh, as I just mentioned right now the reason for the above application is they can go long distances without getting scattered. All right. Let's move on. Now, the diagram given below over here, the lens is made up of two parts. The upper part as well as the lower part, they are made up of two different uh, materials. So basically, I would not recommend that you remember this formula by heart. This is known as lens maker formula, mu minus 1, 1 upon R1 minus 1 upon R2. Now, this is the focal length of the lens. This is the refractive index of the lens. These are the radii of curvature. That means if I complete the circle like this one and this distance is R1 and then if I complete the circle or the sphere using the another curved surface, I'll get this as R2. Usually in equiconvex lens, these two are same, but by using proper sign convention, this becomes plus. But that's okay, you can just ignore the part. If you look at the focal length, you will see that if you substitute one value of mu, you will get one value of focal length. So here there are two different focal lengths that will be that you will be obtaining as a result, as a result of two different refractive index. So if I substitute mu one, I will get 1 upon f1 and then on reciprocating I will get the value of focal length. In the same way I can also say that 1 upon f2 is proportional to mu2 minus 1. If I substitute mu2 I will get another focal length right. So two different or as simple as that if the lens is made up of five different type of refractive indexes there are five different focal lengths of the lens. Let's try to understand this in this way. This is a lens and the upper part is made up of say higher refractive index material. So when the parallel rays when they come in they would be converging somewhere over here. So this would be basically the focal length f1 due to the refractive index mu1. And let's say that the lower part refractive index mu2 is less than mu1. Then in that case the parallel rays coming from the bottom part of the lens will be converging comparatively less. So they would be getting converged at a very far away distance. Converging means bending. If the bending is lens the ray goes to long distance. So for this particular lower part you have different value of focal length that is f2. <coughs> So if, if I generally say that this lens is made up of n different parts having n different refractive indexes, then there are n different focal lengths. That's what this means. Let's move ahead. A glass lens always forms a virtual, always. That means it is definitely not a convex lens. It has to be a concave lens. Please refer to the ray diagrams if you don't understand. In concave lens, in wherever you keep the object, you will always get the virtual erect as well as diminished image. Right. So identify the lens. The answer is concave lens right you give the object anywhere on the principal axis you will get the image between optical center and focus that too smaller in size as uh, as compared to the object and that too is on the same side of the object that means it is virtual in nature okay i am posting a link into the description that will help you out to understand just check out that it is observed that in household circuits parallel connection is used now you know very well that in parallel connection the overall resistance decreases right so if i say that you have a 10 ohm resistance and you have a 20 ohm resistance when, are, when they are connected in parallel. Let's find out the equivalent resistance to understand this 1 upon R1 plus 1 upon R2. So basically this is 2 upon 20 that is 3 upon 20. Now if I on reciprocating the answer is 20 by 3 that is 6.66 that is even less than the least resistance less than this one. 
So if the overall resistance decreases, the power consumption also decreases. So that means what we can say is the power consumption decreases our electricity bill will get reduced because the power consumption in lower resistance system is very less right okay second thing is if suppose the electric electric current now has two paths to go if this bulb suppose these are 10 and 20 ohm bulbs if one of the bulb fuses the another bulb can remain on that is due to the fact that the current has the another path to go if you connect it in series like this and if one of the bulb fails that means if this bulb goes off the current does not have the returning path so the current will not come out of the battery or the system itself so in parallel system if one goes off one appliance goes off others remain on or remains functioning i misspelled it sorry a p p l i a n c e correct okay now let's move ahead a transformer is used to change high alternating emf that means let's say this is 20000 volts to a low emf let's say 200 volts so of course this is a step down transformer right the frequency doesn't change this is a step down transformer and identify the type of yeah we just identified that it is a uh, step down transformer step down transformer now what happens is in step down transformer we have a primary coil this is primary coil having more number of turns and then in secondary coil we have less number of turns so if i call this as np the number of turns over here is ns the number of turns ns is smaller than np and by the way the turn ratio the turn ratio the turn ratio is ns upon np so of course this number is less and this is larger so the overall answer or the turn ratio will be less than one that is the answer to the problem and step up transformer they actually increase the <coughs> emf but you need to understand that the energy or the power in any of the cases remains the same 2000 watt power goes in 2000 watt power comes out only voltage and current they keep on increasing or decreasing that's it so in step up transformer ns is larger than np and the turn ratio is greater than one okay now a solid of mass 60 kg is kept at 100 degrees celsius and is placed in uh, 150 grams of water at 20 degrees celsius the final temperature is 25 degrees celsius calculate the heat capacity you need to understand this please go slow in these kind of numericals you may make an error so ideally diagram is not required but it's my habit to draw the diagram right so suppose this is water 150 grams and its temperature is 20 degree celsius i am keeping a piece of whatever this solid is and its mass is 60 grams and it is at 100 degrees celsius so what happens is the higher temperature object is going to lose the heat energy the lower temperature substance the water is going to absorb the heat energy we will assume the complete transfer of energy over here no energy is being absorbed by the vessel because the specific heat capacity of the vessel is not given had it been that we would have to consider that right so we don't have to worry about that so heat is being lost by whom lost by the solid and it will be gained by whom? water so the temperature of the solid decreases temperature of water goes on increasing and the final temperature at equilibrium is 25 degrees celsius so if i say heat lost by solid is the same heat gained by water now mc delta t heat lost and heat gained is also mc delta t here mass of the solid specific heat capacity of the of the solid and difference in temperature right i should be very specifically telling you all guys here mass of water specific heat capacity of water delta t please understand when you write down heat lost is equal to heat gain we take the difference in the temperature positive it is not tf minus ti had it been like that then one of the terms would be negative it will be difficult for you to deal so here the temperature difference is positive so mass of the solid no need to convert that into <coughs> I mean grams because I am mean, into kg because gram gram from both sides will get cancelled. So 150 into specific heat capacity of solid is not given. Okay, we don't need that also. S yes, and delta T. By the way, delta T itself uh, is final minus initial. Please don't do that. Difference in temperature. So 100 minus its temperature before losing it and its temperature after losing it. So 100 minus 25. So 75. That is equal to mass of water. So what it is? It is one what is the mass of water yeah sorry 160 grams into specific heat capacity 4.2 grams and then delta t is final minus initial earlier it was 20 then it became 25 so final minus initial please avoid that i have 
wanted to say that it is higher temperature minus lower temperature otherwise you will end up into a negative sign on one side and it is a wrong calculation so 25 minus 5 is 5 now ideally we don't require specific heat capacity let me keep this as ms only because mass into specific heat capacity itself is the heat capacity right so h is equal to 60 times 4.2 into 5 divided by 75 so this is what we are supposed to do so 5 ones are 5 again ones are 5 5 fives are 25 15 15 ones are 15 fours are so 4 twos are 8 4 fours are 16 so 16.8 joules per gram and that is due to the fact that mass into specific heat capacity heat capacity heat capacity is basically m into c into delta t right sorry m into c and delta t is taken as one so what you can write is over here as uh, this can be written as kg and this is uh, kg mc delta t so joule per kg degree celsius so i am sorry i made a small mistake it is joule per degree celsius or degree kelvin is also one of the same answers because one degree rise in celsius is one degree rise in kelvin okay let's move ahead so 16.8 joule per degree celsius is the heat capacity what is nuclear waste and um, state one method to dispose it of i think this problem is very easy you can do it by yourself also nuclear waste means whatever leftover that you get after the nuclear reactions get over that is the nuclear uh, waste and there are two reasons that i have given that nuclear waste should be stored in stainless containers and that too the outside container should be made up of lead because lead shields the radiation it doesn't allow the gamma radiations to go out you have to be careful that wherever you bury it that place should be very very far away from the places where people live and it should not also fall into the hands of the criminals and all those things right you can i think you you know that very well okay this diagram of the fish which is inside the water you look at this carefully the this fish is actually inside the water and uh, you are able to see the top part of the water and the fish image over here this is due to total internal reflection tir right so the name the phenomenon that is total internal reflection now in the next case we are supposed to uh, continue the path of this uh, particular ray in case of prism so this is 45 so of course this is 45 degree also now this ray since it is falling at an angle of 90 degrees so angle of incidence is 0 degree so this ray would go straight right here no deviation take place it directly goes in right and then if i draw a normal i need to find out what this angle is if this angle is more than critical angle tir will happen if this is less than critical angle refraction will happen so of course this is 90 this is 45 so this is 45 degree if this is 45 and this is normal so this angle is also 45 degree so of course the critical angle for the glass is 42 and this angle of incidence at this surface is bigger than 42 so the ray will suffer tir like this this is also 45 this is also 45 this is of course 45 so this has to be 90 when a ray falls at an angle 90 degree it simply goes like this outside correct so this is the complete path of the ray right, that we have drawn <clears throat> moving on now the refractive index of the water at certain temperature is this when the temperature is increased by 40 degree refractive index changes to x now what happens when you heat up any medium the medium becomes lesser and lesser denser so the refractive index of the medium decreases with the temperature so of course x will be less than 1.33 when you heat any medium state two differences between the normal reflection and the total internal reflection in normal reflection first of all we have to use any anything like we have to use mirrors or such kind of things here total internal reflection doesn't require mirror see it also happens uh, you know through a surface of water also but the most important difference i should not say this is a very good difference right this is just for the talking purpose but when we come to writing purpose in normal reflection some energy is absorbed by mirrors here 100 percent of the energy is reflected not a single part of the energy is being absorbed so when you are talking about a plane mirror when 100 percent of the light falls on it some amount of energy is absorbed by the plane mirror but it doesn't happen in the case of tir 100 percent of the energy takes place and reflection happens at all angles at all angle of incidence reflection happens but tir only happens when angle of incidence i is greater than critical angle so these are the two major differences less anything you can build it up by yourself right <clears throat> okay now over here <clears throat> there is an object uh, which is placed at some distance above the glass slab and you know the image shifts towards the towards the observer when you look at it so name and define the phenomenon responsible for seeing the image at a different uh, position i should say that uh, name and define so the name is refraction 
and refraction means uh, bending of light i should say bending of light rays when light goes from one medium to another due to change in speed change in speed so that is the answer to the a part now state the effect on x x is basically the shift when y increases and y decreases right so if you are aware about this formula the shift through a glass slab is equal to thickness times 1 minus 1 upon mu so shift is directly proportional to the thickness i should be saying thickness does not mean the actual thickness suppose if i name the glass slab as a b c d here the light is entering through surface ab and leaving through surface cd so the perpendicular distance between ab and cd that is y or that length is bc that is the thickness had it been lights going like this a b c d suppose the light would have entered from here and then it would have exited from the another end then a b would have been the thickness please note that right so here if y increases the shift also increases because shift is directly proportional to the thickness so on y increases the shift that is x increases and here shift or the x decreases is the answer to the problem an object is placed at a distance of 24 centimeter from convex lens focal length is f so i should say if that the focal length is plus 8 centimeter correct and the object is placed at so u object distance is always negative and we can directly guess the answer see it is because of the fact that the if you talk about a lens if this f is 8 then 2f is 16 centimeters right and then the object is beyond the 2f because the object distance is 24 centimeters and all distances are measured from the optical center so in this case the image should be formed between f and 2f on the other side real inverted and little bit smaller right so the answer uh, will be somewhere in between uh, 8 and 16 so let's calculate it very fast so 1 upon 8 is equal to 1 upon v minus 1 upon u basically this is the lens formula so 1 upon plus 8 is equal to 1 upon v minus 1 upon u this is minus 24 and 1 upon v so 1 upon 8 is equal to 1 upon v plus 1 upon 24 so 1 upon v is equal to 1 upon 8 minus 1 upon 24 so this is 3 upon 24 minus 1 upon 24 2 upon 24 uh, please do not take the LCM up and down direct multiplied by 3 and 3. So 1 upon V is equal to 1 upon 12. So V is equal to plus 12 centimeter is the answer to the problem. As we guessed it that it should be between 8 and 16. We got it. Calculate the distance of the image. That is what is V. Correct. Nature of the image. Of course, it is real and inverted. Real and inverted. You should be very thorough with the ray diagrams. Uh, again, I am posting the link in the description to uh, go ahead with the ray diagrams. So now let's solve question number 5. The second part okay here we are given that uh, the sunlight passes through water droplets so what happens is when the sunlight passes through the glass prism the same effect is seen in case of the water droplets there is only one difference that in case of prism only dispersion takes place and refraction take place but in case of the water droplets while the spectrum is produced or the rainbow is produced the total internal reflection also takes place right but we don't have to worry about that right now over here in case of the rainbow so which color shows maximum angle of deviation and the minimum angle of deviation so ideally the raindrops they behave as the prism so what happens is in case of the prism if i draw like this and if we have the white light and instead of going straight what happens is one ray i mean i out of with your the violet and the red one of them is number one and number two so when they come out they undergo refraction like this now when you extend them backwards we get the angle of deviation and here also when i extend this backwards i get the angle of deviation so larger the angle of deviation is for the light which travels with lesser the speed okay so that is violet so this ray number two is violet and this upper ray is the red so it's just like you are swimming in a river and if your speed okay let me draw that if this is a river and if you want to cross the river like this exactly at the opposite end of the river but you are a very slow swimmer then the water will carry you in this direction so instead of going straight you will be going and reaching somewhere over here so that means your angle of deviation is very large if your speed is slow such kind of uh, the theory i am applying it over here so lesser the speed that means the violet light so larger is the angle of deviation right so which color shows maximum angle of deviation the answer is violet and which will show the man <coughs> and which color will show minimum the answer is red that is dependent on the basis of the speed instead of sunlight if a green color light passes what will be the color of the emergent ray the answer is green it's because of the fact that prism actually doesn't produce any color so if this is a white light all seven colors that means 
with your VIB, GYO, R, all will be coming out. Only the prism splits them up. But if you only pass any single color light, say for example a red color light, then simply it undergoes refraction and it, that red color light is going to come out and you can measure the angle of deviation like this. Okay, so <clears throat> the correct answer is the green color. Because prism does not produce any color, it only splits up the polychromatic, that means the white light into all different wavelengths. Yeah. Now, this is comparatively a good question. The mixture of red, blue and green passes through a convex lens. So, first of all, you need to understand that the refractive index, the focal length and refractive index are inversely proportional to one another. And uh, if you are able to remember, I should say you can just remember this one, mu minus 1 times 1 upon r1 minus 1 upon r2. Uh, please don't worry about this part. You can only see that this is a lens maker formula and the uh, focal length and refractive index are inversely proportional. Now, if I write down refractive index three times for the green, violet okay red and blue so instead of uh, uh, the violet they have taken blue with your violet and indigo are least sensitive to our eye so that means they have neglected it so a refractive index of red light is speed in air divided by speed in glass speed in air upon speed in glass that is vr uh, here vg and here vb now the speed of red is the highest so the refractive is going to be the least so least the refractive index highest the focal length so, the parallel ray after passing through this convex lens will go to a very long distance and meet at the principal axis. So, this point I am going to call this as P and this is the focal length for the red light. Now, if you talk about the, the blue light, blue light has the least speed, so highest refractive index. So, 1 upon F proportional to mu of B for the blue light, the refractive index is highest, the focal length is least. So, parallel ray would meet somewhere over here at point Q and this distance is the focal length for blue color and the green would be somewhere in between say p q and r and this distance would be the focal length for the green light and you can even understand it like that this that largest the speed lesser is the angle of deviation so more farther the ray goes in that way also you can write the answer right so what i should be writing is that the focal length of the red light larger than focal length of green light larger than the focal length of blue light that is the answer to the problem name the invisible light which can be obtained by using a quartz prism right now why quartz prism because quartz actually it allows uv rays to pass through it because if you use glass prism now then glass is a very good absorber of uh, the infrared radiations that's why we are using quartz so basically if you use a glass prism and if these are uv radiations they will not come out no spectrum will be obtained on the screen over here i'm not saying that you are able to see anything but the uh, the detectors of UV radiation and, and you might remember it well that the AGCL solution turns black. So, if you even keep the AGCL solution over here, let me call this as AGCL solution, it will not turn black anywhere because this glass itself absorbs the UV radiation. So, I want that the ultraviolet rays must pass through the, uh, the prism. So, I mean that I should be using this as a quartz prism. And now what is going to happen? You place the AG solu AGCL solution anywhere and you will see that the color changes to black because quartz allows the UV radiation to pass through it. The state one uses, it is used to sterilize medical instruments. It kills the bacteria and that's why we have the UV filters at our home, RO plus UV filters. Plus they also stimulate the uh, vitamin D formation in animals also, right? And these are also used to check purity of gems the diamonds and the stuff right just remember that name of radiation having wavelength longer than ultraviolet radiation infrared you can write infrared microwaves radio waves anyone the next question states that uh, sumit and sachin went uh, for a track and during the journey they visited a cottage they suspended their bags uh, to two ropes and which are hanging from p and q uh, on a wheel and which can rotate about a point so let me draw a wheel which is larger enough so that it's pretty much visible this is the pivot point right now, there are two points. This is point Q and Sumit hangs his bag over here. Let me call the weight of the Sumit's bag is WS, right? SU for Sumit. And now, at a little bit larger distance, okay, let me call this as point O, a little bit larger distance at point P, who hangs the bag? Sachin hangs the bag. So, the weight of Sachin's bag is W, let me call WSA, correct? Now, see, had it been something like this, that at this is uh, or the point O and this is point Q and this is point P. Now, suppose at point P, if I hang the bag, then the entire wheel would rotate in clockwise direction. So, the weight due to Sumit's bag is going to turn the entire uh, entire wheel in the clockwise direction. Whereas, if 
sorry, uh, the such inch one. Whereas the summit's bag, if I hang it at point Q, then due to that, the entire wheel is going to turn in anti-clockwise direction. But if I say that if both the torques become equal, then the wheel is going to stay in equilibrium. That is what is written over here, right? Now, what do you mean by torque? Torque is weight into perpendicular distance. I want you to look at this diagram, not this one, right? So, so the weight multiplied by the perpendicular distance from the axis is this one, right? Let me just uh, talk about this point that this perpendicular distance is, let me call B Q and the perpendicular distance from point B to the weight is, let me call this as B P. Okay. Now, anti-clockwise torque is equal to force and which force? Weight for the summit's bag. Weight of the summit bag multiplied by the perpendicular distance that is B Q. That is equal to because the wheel is in equilibrium. So, according to the principle of moments, the clockwise and anti-clockwise torque become equal. So, weight of the Sachin's bag multiplied by BP. Now, it's clearly visible that BQ is smaller and BP is larger. And for the equation to be balanced, the weight of the Sumit's bag must be definitely greater than the weight of the Sachin's bag. Now, the Sachin's bag weight, I think it's already given as 18 kgf. That means we can very well say that the bag of Sumit, the Sumit's bag is definitely greater than 18 kgf weight mass 18 kilograms state the reason why i should be saying that since the torques are balanced i should be writing since wheel is in equilibrium so anti clockwise torque is equal to clockwise torque but since the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation of summit that is dq it is less which means that is the weight for the Sumit's bag has to be larger than the weight of the uh, Sachin's bag, right? Now, the mathematical equation, that is what just now I wrote over here. So, this one is the mathematical equation. That is the answer to B part. Okay. Now, what we are given is we are being asked to draw uh, the complete diagram, but the direction of force is involved also to obtain maximum. We are in convenient direction. Convenient direction means effort must be downwards. Now, Effort must be downwards and velocity ratio. So, you might be knowing that if effort, if effort is downward, velocity ratio itself is equal to the number of pulleys. So, over here the answer is 3. Now, let me complete the diagram. I will start the diagram from here. I will keep on winding the rope. The first pulley, now the bottom pulley. Now, this rope goes over this pulley and this goes down and over here. Now, all the tension forces, one tension force here, one another here, another over here. Correct. And here, the effort is being balanced by a single tension. Correct. <coughs> so, velocity ratio is the number of tension supporting the load. So, directly answer is 3 also. Now, efficiency is equal to MA upon VR. Now, since efficiency is 0 0.8 because 80% 80 is 80 by 100, that is 0 0.8. Mechanical advantage, we need to find out. V is 3. So, simply mechanical advantage is 3 is 24. So, 2.4 is the answer to the problem. Now, the figure shows the simple pendulum of mass 200 grams. So, the mass over here is 200 grams and this is the extreme position. So, on extreme position, the bob stops. So, the kinetic energy is 0. Potential energy Eb is mgh. The mass is how much? 200. So, let me convert everything into SI unit. So, this is kg into g is, did they give the value of g? Acceleration due to gravity? Yes, it's given 10 meter per second square at the, in the C equation. So, that is 10 meter per second square into height above the ground is 5 meter. So, 3 zeros, 3 zeros cut. So, 10 joule is the potential energy, which means 10 joules should be the total kinetic energy at point A because law of conservation of energy states that the total energy at A becomes equal to total energy at B. But at point A, the potential energy is 0. So, that means the entire energy is the kinetic energy that is 10 joules. This much I should be very well aware before solving the problem. So, just now I solved the potential energy at point B is 10 joules. Total mechanical energy at C, the total mechanical energy means sum of kinetic and potential, which is same everywhere, ignoring the air resistance. So, that means the total energy is kinetic plus potential that is equal to 10 joules. What is the speed of the bob? So, I must make a statement that half mv square and the maximum speed will be at the area where you have maximum kinetic energy. So, point A. That is equal to total kinetic energy at A is fully mechanical energy that is 10 joules. So, half times, uh, I should be also writing this as m times v square is equal to highest potential energy at point B, that is mgh, mm getting cancelled. 
So V square is equal to 2 G H that is equal to V is equal to under root of 2 times G is 10 times height 5. So 10 meter per second is the answer to the problem. Now, person standing in front of the cliff fires a gun. You should be very careful in these problems. If you have trouble in these kind of questions, please see the link in the description. Watch the video. I am guaranteeing your concepts will be clear. So there is a cliff. It is requested to all the viewers that please make a diagram in this situation. Right now, a fires a gun. So uh, the person standing in front of the cliff he fires a gun. So since the sound is being made, sound will travel d distance and d distance back. Let me call this distance as d. So the sound travels distance 2d that is equal to v into t. Now the echo is heard after three seconds. So the total time of the journey of the sound from here and back is 2 into d is equal to 336 meter per second is already given time is given so d is equal to 336 times 1.5 or you may simply write it down as like 3 by 2 2 ones are ones are 2 6 are 12 2 eights are 16 and then <clears throat> 3 eights are 24 to carry 3 6 are 18 20 zero to carry 3 ones are 3 5 so 504 meters is the answer to the first problem now after moving a certain distance from the cliff he fires the gun and echo is heard 1.5 seconds later so that means he is coming nearer to the cliff had it been going far away the echo would take a longer time to come in so that means <clears throat> earlier the person was here and firing a gun now he walks towards the hill let's say by distance x so the new distance is d minus x correct and when he fires the gun the sound would travel d minus x again d minus x so twice of d minus x is two times sorry is equal to speed multiplied by time so two times just now we found the distance 504 minus x <coughs> that is speed remains the same times 1.5 is 3 by 2 so 504 minus x is equal to 336 times 3 by 4 4 ones are 4 eights are 32 4 fours are 16 so <coughs> 3 eights are 20 3 fours are 12 2 1 carry 3 eights are 24 25 so that means 504 minus 252 is the distance right uh, what could be this mm, i think the same one because right 252 multiplied by 2 itself <coughs> is 504 let me check once again 252 times 2 goes to the 4 five zero and zero yeah five yeah so that means the distance walked by the person is 252 two meters that is the answer to the problem so let's move on a radioactive nucleus x emits alpha particle so basically alpha particle is a helium nuclei so 2 ha4 this is atomic number 4 is the mass number and followed by two beta particles by the way beta particle is simply an electron and electron is written as charge down and mass at the top right to form y which element with respect to x what would be the position of y in the periodic table so let's uh, do that so suppose x z a that is the atomic number and mass number z is the mass number sorry z is the atomic number a is the mass number minus how many alpha particles one so 2 h 4 and minus two electrons that are the beta particles right so minus one times zero now it is going to give you some element y see this is z you just look at the bottom part z 2 and over here so z then this is minus 2 so minus 2 minus minus plus so 2 minus 2 into minus 1 is plus 2. So basically that itself gives you the z. So the atomic number of <coughs> the y itself is the z. So basically they are the isotopes, right? So the answer to b part is isotopes, but I should be uh, very careful. I should be also solving the top part. Now, similarly, a, the look at the top part, a, then 4 and 0, then a minus 4, <coughs> a minus 4 and minus 2 into 0. That is equal to a minus 4. So, the atomic number remains the same, but the mass number changes. So, basically, same atomic number, different mass number. So, they are isotopes. So, I should be saying isotopes. Please understand what I have done is x, suppose it is z a and you take up any particle, suppose two alpha particles. So, alpha particle is alpha or he2, he4 or let me say three alpha particle, right? Then what would you get? Y. Now, see z, what I have done is z minus 3 to the 6. That gives you z minus 6. That will be the atomic number of at the y and similarly at the top a minus so it will be a minus three times the four so a minus 12 that would be the mass number a minus 12 would be the mass number 
correct and if they are electrons then this minus minus becomes plus so with respect to x what would be the position now position of isotopes is the same in the periodic table right now they are known as isotopes now if the atomic number of y is 80 what would be the atomic number of x i said that atomic number remains the same so atomic number of x is also 80 only correct let's move on a boy tunes a radio channel of 93.5 name and define the scientific wave phenomenon now what happens is that when you set a frequency from a mobile tower or a radio station and if i have a radio right and if i set the same one then the frequency matches amplitude of the sound waves becomes maximum so that is resonance so the frequencies of what you set if the receiver of what you set and whatever the frequency of the waves they come they should match then and only then the resonance and the uh, uh, resonance will happen and the amplitude of the sound wave will be maximum and you will be able to hear the channels now define so you should be saying that when the frequency of when the frequency of the external periodic force becomes equal to the natural frequency of the object the object oscillates with maximum amplitude which is known as resonance it's a special case of forced vibration name the important important characteristics of the sound that is being affected during the this phenomenon so i should be saying the amplitude amplitude of the sound wave is going to be greatly increased so the loudness so basically loudness is the characteristic of the sound which is going to be affected right frequency matches and the loudness will increase you are supposed to convert 93.5 93.5 megahertz basically if m is small then it is millihertz so 93.5 mega means 10 raised to 6 hertz is 1 upon second so this can be written as 9.35 into 10 raised to 1 more 0 i am just going to transfer this decimal over here 1 more 0 at the top and 1 upon second or simply you can write down this as hertz correct that is the answer to the problem okay look at this circuit very well right i am seeing, seeing something like dual switch so this part this part is known as dual switch please look at the dual switch very very carefully in your textbook right so i am just removing this part right sorry this was one upon second okay so this is a dual switch and now you look at this ac setup so the current always goes in you know it it uh, uh, comes in the switch so from the power supply right it comes into the switch then you turn in on the switch then from the switch it goes inside the appliance so if i put my mobile charger inside the switchboard behind the switchboard there is an ac current now the moment i turn on the switch the current comes from the switch into the uh, into the mobile charger so here b point is the entry point of the current because look the b wire is connected to the switch so this is the live wire the current enters from the live wire now this will go inside the coil right and then it will uh, come out of the wire a so that means that would be a neutral wire and since i see earthing in c so this becomes uh, sorry if i if i see the grounded part over here in c wire so that is always a uh, earthing now what i notice over here the fuse is wrongly connected the fuse must always be connected in the live wire so the fuse must be connected here so the fuse is not going to solve our purpose now let let us look at the questions which one of the two a or b should be a live wire so the answer is b in case of overload that means if excessive current flows into your system who is going to protect the o one coil no one because the large amount of current will still enter and it will still go inside the oven and it is going to damage the oven because there is no fuse which is connected to the live wire right <clears throat> so answer is no the fuse will not serve its purpose give the meaning of the statement 600 watt this can be written as 600 joule per second if connected to 220 volts so in one second in one second ideally if there is 100 percent of the efficiency of the bulb 600 joules of electrical energy will be converted into 600 joules of light energy correct but at 220 volts if you give more than 220 volts the bulb filament is going to get broken less than 220 volts bulb the bulb will operate at less power the bulb will be dim so to operate at its full brightness 220 volts is required let's look at a nuclear reaction radon and then this is polonium okay what do i see over here decrease in the atomic number by two so basically the charge as well as the atomic number mass number should be balanced so 86 at the bottom rn is equal to polonium right uh, gives that is 84 then i should be understanding that here it should be 2 correct and then 222 to 218 so there is decrease in the 4 222 218 so here it should be 4 2 he4 that means this is an alpha particle so basically the alpha decay is going to happen what will be the effect of radiation when it is allowed to pass through the electric field very easy what happens suppose this is a positive plate 
and this is a negative plate and if you pass an alpha particle alpha particle is made up of two protons two neutron so it is positively charged so it will be deflected towards the negative plate alpha particle would be deflected towards the negative plate that is the answer to the problem let us look at uh, the b part and sorry the b the third part let's observe the the circuit and calculate the resistance of the circuit when key completes the circuit that means you are closing the key at that time let me make a new circuit this is 2 ohm now this these two are connected in series so this becomes one resistor your job is to keep on reducing the circuit so 5 plus 3 8 ohm now again the battery's resistance is going to be connected over here so this is 0 0.4 ohm now these two are connected in parallel so i should be saying that 1 upon resistance that is 1 by 2 plus 1 by 8 so this becomes 4 by 8 so this becomes 5 by 8 so the equivalent resistance is 8 by 5 so now let me rub this part okay so now what do i have i have a single resistor of 8 by 5 ohms right and then the battery's resistance will be connected in series like this 0 0.4 ohm so 8 by 5 what is 8 by 5 5 8 is 40 right and oh, let me divide and 8 by 5 so 5 ones are 5 what, what is left 5 3 so 0 6 are. so basically 1.6 so this is 1.6 ohms and this is 0.4 because they are in series whatever current comes out of the battery the same current will flow through both of the resistance so the total resistance is 1.6 plus 4 answer 0 0.4 that is 2 ohm is the answer to our problem so that means 2 ohm is the answer here calculate the current through 3 ohm resistance when the circuit is complete right <coughs> So, if I apply the Ohm's law, V is equal to I times R, the total voltage is 4 volts. We don't know what is the current. The resistance is 2. So, which means the total current coming out of the battery is 2 amperes. Correct. Now, what are we supposed to ask? What is being asked? How much current is going to flow through the circuit? Okay. So, now, let me make some space over here to calculate. I would be requiring more space over here. All right. Let's begin. So, now I have 2 Ohm resistance. Now, simply, I can write down this as 8 ohm or 5 ohm and 3 ohm, it doesn't matter. Like this. And then, there is 0 0.4 ohm resistance, which is the internal resistance of the cell. Now, please note that 2 ampere current comes out of the battery. Now, this current is going to split up into two parts, some current I1 at the top, I2 at the bottom. But the same current I2 is going to flow through 5 ohm and 3 ohm resistance. But again, when the current comes out, that will be simply 2 ampere again, which will pass from here. So, if I put a voltmeter here, 2 times 0 0.4, so 0 0.8 volts. So, out of 4 volts, listen to me carefully, out of 4 volts, potential difference 0 0.8 is always, is already used. Now, here, if I plug in another voltmeter across these two, I would be getting the answer out of 4 minus 0 0.8, so it will be 3.2 volts. Now, 3.2 volts will be connected across both of them. So, if I plug in a new voltmeter here also 3.2 volts and here also 3.2 volts. Why is it so? Because they are connected in parallel and parallel the potential difference is the same. Right. So, 2 ampere. Now, just look at the top resistor, 2 ohm and 2 ampere current was entering in and here there is 5 ohm resistor and here there is 3 ohm resistor. Now, look here the potential difference was 3.2 volts which means this current which was I1 was I1 was equal to 3 0.2 divided by 2, so answer is 1.6 amperes. Correct. 2, yeah, it's correct. So out of 2 ampere, 1.6 ampere goes up, so 0 0.4 ampere goes down. So the same 0 0.4 ampere will pass from 5 ohm as well as 3 ohm. Again, they will rejoin back and will come out as 2 ampere, then they will pass through that tiny internal resistance cell of 0. Point, internal resistance of 0 0.4 ohm. So the answer to the problem that is calculate the current is 0 0.4 ampere. Let's move with question number 9. What mass of ice at 0 degree needs to be added to pull it down from here to here? Let's make a diagram. I always suggest my viewers and the students to draw a diagram, right? So, we have uh, 2.1 kg of water, which was at 75 degrees Celsius. And the moment you put a piece of ice, 0 degrees Celsius, right? Now, we don't know what is the mass, so let's assume this is M. So, heat energy flows from higher temperature to lower temperature, so from water to the ice. Now, what happens is, uh, the temperature of the water is going to decrease because it is losing heat energy and then uh, the entire mass of the water sorry entire uh, the mass of the ice is going to first of all melt and then that mass of water its temperature is going to increase to 25 degrees celsius please understand 
that here two things are happening ice of some mass m right which was at 0 degree celsius and here water at 75 degree celsius now it is cooling cooling and finally coming to 25 degree celsius that means now further cooling is not happening so this is the final state of water by the time this entire mass m of ice has completely melted into water so now you have m grams of water or m kg of water which is at 0 degree celsius now this water also its temperature rises to 25 degree celsius so this part is basically this part is basically heat gained and this part is heat lost correct so heat lost is equal to heat gain the principle of calorimetry heat lost is equal to heat gained in heat gain you will have only one term sorry in heat lost you will have only one term mc delta t now here mass of water c of water and temperature difference please note delta t has to be positive please do not make this mistake right and here first of all the entire mass is melting so ml and then whatever the mass of water you have because ice is converting into water its temperature is going to rise so m c delta t this is the mass of the ice because whatever the mass of the ice was there the same mass of water is formed the c of the water now because it is water now delta t difference in temperature <coughs> sorry so let's calculate m we don't know a latent heat of uh, fusion is 336 plus m again is the same c is 4.2 and this is final minus initial see the ice was zero the water formed was at zero and then that water went to 25 so the difference in temperature is 25 minus zero so it is 25 that is equal to mass of water it's given 2.1 kg okay on that side it is kg so i'll have to convert this into grams a little bit careful okay yeah so i'll convert this into uh, grams so 2100 grams times c is 4.2 Temperature difference from 75 to uh, 25, it is 50. So I should be better writing this as M common 336 plus 25 times 4.2. That is equal to uh, 2100, 2100 times 42 times 5. I will just remove one uh, zero over here. Now let me uh, calculate what is the value of 25 times 4.2. That is 105 plus. 336 so this is 441 so m into 441 that is equal to now i should be multiplying 2100 times 5 times 42 so this is basically 472500 if i divide this by 441 the answer is somewhere around 1071.4 in grams so that is basically 1.07 kg is the answer to the problem so let's move on to the next part. The diagram shows the cooling curve for a substance. State the temperature at which the substance condenses. That means condensation takes place only of gas. Earlier I had a doubt whether this is solid or liquid or gas. But since this is a condensation taking place, that means from gas to liquid. So at this particular point, let me call this point as A, this point as B, this point as C, D and E. So at point A, you have a gas. Now the temperature of the gas remains constant and what is happening is the heat energy is uh, you know being removed out because this is a cooling curve so that means you are cooling removing the heat so at constant temperature the state of the gas is going to change from gas to liquid so at b point you will be having entire gas converting into liquid but in between a and b you will be having a mixture of gas and liquid now once you have the complete liquid its temperature falls from 150 degrees to 60 degrees celsius now once the liquid is reached at point c the liquid starts converting into solid because now the reverse process is going to happen you are continuously removing the heat energy so the temperature fell from 150 to 60 degree between b and c now the liquid solidifies right from c to d so at d you will have complete solid and in between you will have liquid plus solid mixture that takes place at a constant uh, uh, temperature you know that right that is what is known as freezing now once you have d that is complete solid the temperature of the solid will fall from 60 to 10 at e but here also you will have solid itself now what is being asked that state the temperature at which the substance condenses that means the condensation of the gas takes place at 150 degree celsius now the temperature in which the substance is in liquid state so uh, it is between 150 degrees to 60 degrees in between these two it is in the liquid state why do we prefer the ice for cooling because the latent heat of ice is 336 joule per gram and that's a huge value or if you just convert this into kg 336 into 10 raised to 3 
joules per kg. That means you put 1 kg of ice into a water, it pulls out 336 into 10 raised to 3. That means 336000 joules of heat energy from a substance and that is going to tremendously lower the temperature of any liquid. That's why. All right, let's move on to the next problem. So here immediately by looking at the diagram, I'm getting the feel that I'm supposed to use the lens law. So what lens law states that if the magnet is moving towards the coil, this part of the coil will behave as a magnet and its pole will be created such that it will oppose the motion of the magnet. So south coming nearer, so it will not allow the south to come nearer. So which means this part will behave as a south pole and this as the north pole. Correct. Because south would want, would never want the another south to come back. So if magnet wants to come in this direction, this coil will repel. It will not allow this to come down because it will oppose the motion of the magnet. So magnet coming down, it would like to push the magnet up. So south pole. Correct. And now once the magnet passes like this, comes out, this is south, this is north, then this part would become south because it would not allow the magnet to go down. It will oppose the flow of the, I mean the motion of the magnet. So magnet wants to go down, this coil will automatically turn its polarity from north to south and it will try to attract the magnet. Motion of the magnet should be opposed and then this part will become the north. So earlier, right, state the polarity at the top end of the coil when magnet leaves, so answer is north. When magnet leaves the coil, right, outside. The direction of the current was A to B when the magnet entered. What will be the direction of current when the magnet leaves? You see that the polarity has now changed, right, earlier it was south-north, now it is north-south of the coil. So it will be from B to A, the current reverses. Name the law, of course, it is the Lenz law. How could you increase the magnitude of the induced current? There are multiple ways, right? You can increase the number of coil. Sorry, the number of turns in the coil. Another is the motion of the magnet needs to be fast, right? So, but anyway, one of the ways is given, so you can write it. The third way is you can insert an iron rod inside this coil and you will get a larger current. So, I hope that this session was very good for all of you. Please look at the links in the description for uh, more better videos in the physics as well as please subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so, right? Namaste. Thank you very much.